So we're in chapter four, introduction to mechanics. Yeah. Woo, here we go. couple chapters. We're going to study motion. We'll talk about velocity. We'll talk about acceleration. We'll talk about speed. We'll talk about position. We'll do a couple labs. Uh, yeah. The best chapter. The best boring. What is that? We didn't get to do fun stuff once. Depends on what you define as fun stuff. Lab projects. Because lab projects don't. It's, it's a myth for everyone to think that just because it's fun, you're learning something. Moment. 
<laughs> so we are going to spend a little bit of time talking about history, not a ton, okay? Um, have we we've talked about one of these two guys before? Yeah, yeah. Aristotle and Galileo. Is the other guy I want to spend some time talking about. You know, it's funny. I think I've said this before. Aristotle kind of gets credit for a lot of things, or he's known as like being a really smart guy. But then you like research what he did, and he doesn't seem so smart. And I'll explain why on the next couple slides. It'll make sense. Okay. So Aristotle did some work in the area of physics, and, and he said that we must first understand why objects move before we can understand how objects move. Does that make a lot of sense to you? Can you find the why before you know a how? Maybe sometimes. Um, usually in physics and science-related things, you probably want to know how something's moving, and then you infer the why. Because not always is it obvious. So he sees a balloon rise, and he says, why does it rise? Right? He's not thinking, how does it rise? He's thinking, why does it rise? Oh, it just makes logical sense that if something's rising, it desires to rise. And then he takes a rock, and he drops it, and he finds that the rock falls to the ground. And he goes, well, why? It's because the rock desires and has a love for the ground. But do you see how applying the how might be important in, before you try to figure out why something does what it does? Okay. Well, he is kind of right on this. Objects do have a natural tendency, but believe it or not, objects' natural tendency is to do nothing. I find that ironic. Sounds like the human nature to me. Everybody hear what I said? An object's natural tendency is to do nothing. We'll talk much more about that when we get into Newton's laws and we say that an object in motion tends to stay in motion and an object at rest tends to stay at rest. So actually what objects try to do is do nothing but they're doing what they're doing. So if they're moving, let's just keep moving. If we're at rest, let's just stay at rest. I don't really desire to do anything. Okay? So then Galileo came along and he said, no, 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 no. 
Mr. Aristotle, your time is up. We should study how things move first and then describe the why afterwards. go run around and trip over and fall on the ground and yes please see that, that's humans natural tendency natural tendency to want to do nothing to want to do the easiest thing possible to want to not to have any responsibilities that's called sin Studies of mechanics. And what are the mechanics again? Uh, study of motion. Okay. So within motion, there's quite a bit of things that uh, we're going to focus on. We're going to focus on what causes things to move. Forces. We have a whole chapter dealing with forces. Okay. We're going to talk about how things move. Kinematics. And we're going to talk about how Stationary objects can react to push or pulls. So the main topics in the next three months are going to be motion, forces, and energy. So I realize this first day is rather boring. Would you agree? A little bit boring. Not boring at all. Okay. Well, we kind of have to set the stage here a little bit before we get into um, the meat and potatoes, if you will, of of, of motion. Okay. Um, I've learned as I've gotten older that. Vocabulary might be the most important thing in life. I mean, don't, don't read into that too much. What I mean by that is, if you don't know words, if you don't know what words mean, like, God desired to reveal himself through what? Words. Like, knowing and understanding words is very important in life. So if you don't know vocabulary words, you're going to be able to understand what the what 
a vocabulary word is going to be used for and how it's applied? No. Same thing in anything, whether it's English, whether it's Spanish. If you don't know what Spanish words mean, can you do anything in Spanish? If you don't know what science words mean, are you going to be able to be very successful in science? No. Okay, you guys should be able to answer this real quick. Sometimes common sense, when doing science, we want to isolate our particular thing that we're studying, and we call that isolated boundary that we use to study something as the system. And anything that's not considered the system, do you guys know what we call that? Curious if you have seen or heard of this idea before from a previous science class. It seems pretty common sense at this point, but you'll as you get to a higher level science, you will come become more aware of why we isolate a particular thing. Yes? Is it because you looked or did yeah, you know it? Good. It's surroundings. It kind of makes sense. Whatever's not in the system is surrounding the system, right? So it probably looks goofy up there, but there's a purple trace mark around that person. Okay? We're isolating him as the system. So let's say I wanted to study the motion of that guy moving and he trips. I'm focusing on his motion. I'm not worried about the person in the background kicking the soccer ball, am I? I'm not worried about the person on the swing. Does, that, does the person on the swing affect this guy's motion at all? No. Does this person reading affect that person falling or motion? Does the green grass have an effect? <laughs> okay, they're allergic. Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay? So anything that's not the system is what we would call the surrounding. So if I'm studying the motion of a ball dropping to the ground, I'm isolating the ball, I'm not worried about what you guys are doing, I'm not worried about what's happening outside the classroom, I'm not worried about the color of the ground, I'm not worried about the smell of food or coming from the cafeteria. about that. This becomes important because a lot of times we get caught up in a lot of the little things that don't matter when we're doing physics.
um, frame of reference, I've kind of kind of put both point of reference and frame of reference and morphed them into their own one thing. Um, and believe it or not, there's quite a di quite a few different reference frames that you can look at motion from. And we'll define them, I think, on the next slide. Um, what, nah, I think it might be two slides from now. What a point of reference is, is some stationary location from which you can make an observation. So, stand up. Yeah, sorry. Why don't you go over there? Okay. Um, I'm going to walk towards her, and then I'm going to uh, change where she's located. Watch my motion. What does it appear that I'm doing? Moving toward her, okay? Come over here. Right here. Right there. I'm going to do the same motion. What is the pair that I'm doing? So where is it? Kind of a dumb little analogy, but where you are in reference to something moving plays a very important impact. For example, what if have you ever been in two different cars with somebody else and you were driving right next to each other at the same speed? What is it, does it, how fast does it look like the other person in the other car is moving? It doesn't look like they're moving at all. If you're going the same speed as the other car, it almost looks like everything else is moving around you and, and the car itself isn't moving. That's a different type of reference frame. So what you choose as your reference frame is going to have a big impact on what the motion looks like. Yes? Okay. So a big part of being able to understand motion is choosing a correct reference frame. And you're going to find that you can choose whatever reference frame you want. So what this is saying is there's no the frame of reference. What that means is is there's no frame of reference that you absolutely have to use. There's some subjectivity to it. However, is there a, is there a best frame of reference, do you think? Yes. If you want to be studying how fast something is moving, you probably don't want to be accelerating with the object because it doesn't look like it's what? Moving. Okay? And we're going to actually, where this becomes a really big deal when it comes to physics, is direction. I don't know if you guys knew this, but when you do positives and negatives or add and subtract in math, what you're really doing is moving a direction. You might mind blown. When you subtract, what are you doing? You're moving left on a number line. Minus 4 equals negative 1. Okay, so I started at 3 and I subtracted 4. Which way did I move? Left. Left. On a number line. When you add, actually, what does that give me? Start here. Which way did I move? I know it's kind of uh, elementary, but when you add, 
A positive sign means a direction, is really what it means. In math, it means a direction on a number line. In physics, we're going to use a positive or negative to tell us what direction we're traveling. North is a positive direction. South is a negative direction. East is a positive direction. West is a negative direction. Hence, where we get our quadrants, this would be a plus plus, right? You guys remember this from like seventh grade math? What's this section? Isn't that west and south? Wouldn't those be both be negatives based on what I just told you? Okay? What about here? Plus negative, right? Negative because of south, positive because of okay? And so it becomes very important when you're doing physics. That's not just made up for some fun, fancy reason. It has a purpose because direction tells you the sign of something, or the sign tells you the direction of something. Uh, let me see if I want you to put this in. Hold up. Does that just kind of make sense? Do you feel like you don't need to put that in your, your notes? Yeah. I don't think you really need to put that in your notes. It wouldn't make sense to uh, go to the sun and study the, the, the motion of something on Earth, does it? First of all, you die. But second off, it doesn't make sense. Okay. All right. So, so now remember, very important. There's a whole bunch of frame of references, and you can choose whatever frame of reference you want. However, there's usually a best frame of reference. A good place to have a frame of reference from a math standpoint is to start here at zero, and to keep it positive. Because we like to do math in the positives, right? Because when you throw in negatives, it becomes a little bit more challenging. Not a lot, but a little bit more challenging. All right, I think this is the last slide. Maybe we won't get sound ball, I think. Okay, so there's three types of uh, reference frames. There's a fixed reference frame, there's an accelerated reference frame, and there's a rotational reference frame. We are going to use one of the three probably 99% of the time. Which one do you think that is? Any ideas? What do you think? Which one? Which one do you think would be the one we're probably gonna use the most? Most of the time, going to be the best. Fixed. Absolutely fixed. Now you can have multiple. Like you gotta choose where you're gonna be fixated, if you will. Right? Because in um, Carly was had a fixed frame of reference in both places, right? 
right? She wasn't moving. She was stationary. And I was moving. But it still looked differently. So you can have two fixed reference frames that look a little bit different. So you still have to choose the best frame of reference from a fixed standpoint that makes the most logical sense for a math problem. Okay? This one might be used 1% of the time, and it's going to be specifically important when you're doing relative motion. What that means is how fast something's going relative to how fast you were going. Like two cars, an example of this would be you're in one car, your buddy's in another car, and you're traveling at either the same speed or different speeds. You would be accelerating along with what you're studying. That makes sense? This one's probably the least used and most difficult. It's where the frame of reference is accelerating, but the object is stationary. Okay? There are some practical purposes for that, but we won't really get into that. All I want you to know about that one is the definition. We're going to spend most of our time talking about fixed, maybe talk a little bit about accelerated, uh, but I want you to have the vocab word for C. Done. All right. Thank <laughs> you.